Welcome to the Sober Nation FM podcast, where we're putting recovery on the map. I'm your host, Jonathan Sylvester. This show is brought to you by Sobriety Engine. Do you want to take your recovery to the next level? Do you want more support, community, and fellowship? Sobriety Engine is an incredible community of men and women supporting each other in their recovery. You can get a ton of great tips, resources, and guidance to help you succeed in recovery and in life. Visit sobrietyengine.com to join today. Sober Nation FM is also brought to you by Recover Health. If you're ready to get fit and start living a healthier lifestyle all while supporting your sobriety, then you can learn more about having me as your own personal fitness and nutrition coach at rcvrhealth.com. And whether you're listening to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or watching on YouTube, please share this with your friends, follow, subscribe, and leave a review. Nation, let's hop right into today's episode. Today, I'll be speaking with the author and founder of Spiritual Adrenaline, Tom Shanahan. Thanks for coming on the show, Tom. My pleasure to be here, Jonathan. Thank you so much for having me. Hello to everybody out there in Sober Nation. Yeah, really, really glad to have you, man. And I see you doing some really incredible things with Spiritual Adrenaline. And I want to hear all about the program, how that works in the book. But first, tell us briefly about how your addiction led you to where you are today. All right. First, I just want to say to everybody out there in the Sober Nation community, I hope you're all safe and, and sober and taking advantage of all the virtual options that are out there to really stay sober during these really, really difficult days. Um, at, you know, again, in full, so for 96,000 families now have lost somebody across the country. I get emotional when I, when I think about that. So um, if anybody out there is in one of those families, I feel for you. And I hope that better days are coming both for you, your family, and for our country. So that being said, I'm so glad I'm sober right now. I think the only worst thing that could be happening right now in my life is to be actively using drugs and trying to find a dealer who can sell it to me and getting drunk and being a buffoon and putting myself and other people in danger uh, out during the pandemic and, you know, really probably coming down with COVID-19 very quickly. Yeah. Um, so I'm really glad I just celebrated nine years on May 11th. That's uh, awesome. Of- Congrats. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And I have seven years without cigarette smoking in September of this year. And so all of that being said, um, you know, what happened with me was that I, I grew up in an area where um, in New York City, where it was common for like the cool kids to go have the keg parties and to smoke pot and those kinds of things. And it was really just innocent fun. And everyone in the neighborhood was part of it. And I was the captain of the swim team. I was on the soccer team, um, you know, but on the weekends, everything revolved around drinking. So in college that continued and became also uh, I was lifeguarding, so I was in great shape, but I was also partying like crazy. And then I started smoking cigarettes, and then in college, started doing uh, cocaine. And the reality is, over the years after I got out of college, I was working. I, I got right out of college. I worked at a major television network, Then I went to work for the mayor of New York at his press office. And I had a whole series of what you would call high profile or, you know, success jobs and law firms and things like that. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the way that I celebrated something positive happening in life or the way that, um, you know, the, I would reward myself for, for winning some legal case or whatever would be to go out drinking and then also at, at the latter part of it, get an eight ball Coke and that kind of a thing. And so my world started to get smaller and smaller. And I think, I didn't think anybody knew, but obviously a lot of people knew and I was still practicing law. And then I won't get into all the things that happened, but within within three months, my brother was paralyzed uh, from the neck down skiing um, on March 6, 2010. My colleague who's still my office mate today, her son was paralyzed. (laughs) Uh, in, in a snowboard accident from wow. the neck down. That happened first in January 2010. And then two week, two months after my brother was paralyzed, my mother was uh, diagnosed with throat cancer and had to go out of nowhere and went into like chemo and radiation and all these things. And I had been in a high poli- in a political job in, in New York and I was fired uh, as part of, I blew the whistle on, on certain people who were doing things they shouldn't have been doing. And I wound up being fired and targeted for investigation after they were asked to leave. And so all these terrible things happened together. And then 
to be able to cope with it because I was covering my colleague's law practice. I was helping my brother actively with his therapy to try and get back and walking. I was taking my mom, my sister had three little kids at the time. So I was driving up to Albany. My brother lived in Maine and then to Albany to help with the chemo and the radiation. And the way I kind of balanced everything it seemed like it was a great idea was um, to do coke, <laughs> like yeah. to try and keep up with all this stuff. Right, right. And I was doing a lot of coke and then I would drink to kind of bring it down yeah. and try and meet these obligations. And then eventually what, um, I couldn't get out of bed without, you know, 10, I remember it would be like 10 a.m. I had to have a line to be able to get out of bed. And then I had to drink during the day to like keep myself an even keel because I was doing so much coke just to function. And, you know, like everybody else, uh, it worked for a while, then it stopped working. Yeah. And so when I got to rehab, I was thrilled. Um, I had tried years before to try and give up alcohol, more alcohol than drugs, and failed miserably. I went to meetings. I didn't pay attention. I thought it was um, a meeting-based program, the 12 steps, not okay. a step-based program. Right, right. I, I say, I don't want to do step work. I'm not going to do step yeah, work. Yeah. I don't really need a sponsor. And then I got a sponsor who didn't work steps. Okay. And so what the reality is, nothing really changed for me. I went to meetings and didn't pay attention. I usually text. And then I was still hanging around with the same people, places, and things, right? Okay. So yeah. um, it doesn't work that way. That's why they call it it's a step based program and so in rehab i said i'm going to work all 12 steps they said you can't do that i said i'm going to give it my best try <laughs> so i put on a lot of weight in rehab I, I tried to work all the steps to the extent possible i started working out every day um and then i you know i started putting on a lot of weight i went in at 140 came out 28 days later believe it or not 177 wow and I, you to put weight on and so in that first six months into the you know, the first year really so the reality was i felt great about staying sober i was going sure. to two a day 7 a.m and 7 p.m and then i was you know really working with sponsor my sponsor i had a couple of sponsors but the reality was i started to realize i was smoking more cigarettes than i did when i was actually drinking and doing drugs um, I was eating like I, I would go to Dunkin' Donuts and just get a culata, a pineapple, a strawberry culata, and like four donuts. And that yeah. was like a meal. The point is, I started to understand or feel that my lifestyle wasn't consistent with what I was experiencing okay. at the meetings. And then when I did the step work with my sponsor. And so I started to realize, although people told me, don't worry about anything in your first year, I became concerned that my lifestyle was going to undercut my ability to stay sober in the long run and yeah. really undercut my happiness. And so I went and became a personal trainer. I got certified in sports nutrition. I found a sponsor who is a very well-known personal trainer up where I was in Portland, Maine. My brother lived there, so I moved up to help take care of him. I took a whole year off of practicing law. And I actually, I, 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 you know, it just changed everything. And as I changed the habits, the people I was around in recovery changed. In other words, like when I was, when I was chain smoking two packs or more a day, I would hang out with the people smoking as they went, we go into the meeting. And then I'd take my cigarette break mid meeting with the same couple of the same people. And then we go to the pizzeria or the diner really late after at night. And so what, and when I started to get into the more healthy lifestyle, that changed because I didn't want to be around the smoking. And I started going to morning meetings. I met people who actually went to work out either before or after a meeting. And that became my, uh, my recovery circle. Okay. And so the lifestyle choices in ways that I didn't see at the time impacted my recovery right, and it, right. for me i'm like i knew i wasn't the first person who i experienced this sure. but i really benefited so amazingly from the integration of the 12 steps into what i was eating in my exercise regimen well and so and, and, <laughs> yeah i was just gonna say so i and i want to ask you more about that in just a minute but you and i have spoken before and i and I know other people can relate besides you because I can relate. And, you know, one thing that I picked up on, and we have a pretty similar story. I mean, you know, I was not healthy at all. I was chain smoking like crazy. Uh, I was overweight. I had never been active before, you know, very similar to your story. Got, you know, got into work, decided that I wanted to be healthy. 
um, got into personal training, you know, uh, became a nutritionist, you know, very similar. One thing that I picked up on there that you said that, you know, that I think I can relate to a lot and I try to share with people as well um, that, that feel this way is that, you know, it just felt like something was misaligned. Like I was getting, you know, I was getting connected in this program that was changing my life, you know, 12 step program that was helping me to stay sober. I was starting to, you know, think differently and feel differently about things and actually consider other people and all this stuff. But uh, it was kind of misaligned with how I felt in terms of like energy levels, what I was right. eating. And I think one thing that stuck out to me now, given I like staying sober is the most important thing, right? But that being said, I think one thing that struck me was, is that I saw, you know, w when I got sober and I started going to meetings and stuff, it just started to feel a little off when I would see like, you know, maybe a guy would have like 25 years sober and, um, you know, it'd be super overweight. You know, he's carrying around an oxygen tank, you know, cause he have, has emphysema right, right. and, and I don't mean to make light of this, but it's like, that just seemed totally, I, I was just like, you know, what's going on here? The question that I asked myself was, why did I get sober to keep, you know, living, so to speak, only to be unhealthy and not feel good? So I, so I get where you're coming from. And I guess this is where, uh, you know, everything kind of led up to, you know, writing spiritual adrenaline and, and starting the program. But I want to ask, and you're touching on it a little bit. I mean, why do you think it's really important for people to uh, integrate, you know, these healthy self self care habits and this, uh, you know, these routines into their recovery program? Well, let, let me just say one of the things that helped me quit smoking two years after I gave up alcohol and drugs yeah. was going to nicotine anonymous meetings. I went to a meeting every Friday at the Seafarer's House, which is on you off of Union Square in New York City, and I sat next to a gentleman who brought his tank of oxygen in his electric wheelchair because he could no longer walk. And wow. I'm getting emotional because he would sit right next to me every meeting, and he'd be like, he would share. I. I want to get out of here right now and have a cigarette. And he couldn't break that habit. And the very first thing he would do after the meeting is to go upstairs and have a cigarette. And I remember seeing that. And you know, the cigarette manufacturers, they do everything they can do. 2,000 times of toxins in there yeah. to hook you. But you know, I, I, that by going to those meetings and seeing that, it really emphasized in my mind that I have got to give it up. And so what I found as far as the cigarettes are actually relevant was the better I ate, the less caffeine I drank, the less sugar I consumed, the less anxiety I had that I wanted to kind of um, you know, cover up with, with the cigarettes. And so, look, we've spoken before about this, you know, and I was told early on, I would share sometimes at meetings up in Portland, Maine, about how I was exercising and eating right. I remember being told by a guy who's a fisherman out there, those are outside issues. Right, right. <laughs> We don't do that here. Yeah. I was like, okay. But, you know, so when I researched my book, because I said, this can't be so, because I just felt that there had to be some linkage. And I was aware that Bill W. had done a lot of work with niacin. I was aware that Dr. Bob had done some work on these issues. And some of the old timers who disagree with the fishermen said, no, that, that goes back in the program. So oh, wow. I asked the world headquarters, as you know, for permission to uh, use their research library. I also reached out to Stepping Stones, which was the home of Bill Wilson and his wife Lois. And so I was able to access materials that go back to the founding days of the 12 step world. I mean, Dr. Silkworth was another one who was actively involved, right, in the early days. And so, right from the beginning, and this has been lost in 12 step circles, and I'm not really sure why. I think um, I, I won't speak to why I think that is. I, I'm not sure why I'll say that. Yeah. Um, but right from the beginning, they, there's there's documented evidence, and I write it. There's a whole chapter in my book that covers this material about where they were actually experimenting with foods, sauerkraut, ketchup, hot dogs, baking soda, for example, or specifically try to help to see if it helped people stay sober. It's documented. Bill yeah. Wilson came up with what he called his sister foods to alcohol. There's six of them. I write about it in the book. And he recommended if people are trying to stay sober, that these are the six foods that we recommend you avoid. And Dr. Silkworth was the one. I oftentimes hear, oh, I have the allergy. I have the allergy. Right. Well, Dr. 
so forth, Dr. Duncan Silkworth actually said, it's a misnomer to call addiction an allergy. This is what he actually said. However, we manifest behaviors that are similar to someone who has an allergic reaction. Right. And so what he was also suggesting was, what are we having that reaction to? And this goes way back, 1920s and 1930s. He was at the forefront of saying he, they thought it had something to do with the wheat. They thought it had something to do with the barley. We talk about gluten a lot these days, right? right. And how people react. But they were onto that right from the beginning. Interesting. And so how that got lost in the overall framework of how the STEP program developed, I'm not really sure. But the reality is it was always there. And then when Bill Wilson, he suffered from, you know, when I went to see at, at Stepping Stones, the actual desk where Bill Wilson wrote many of the really important books uh, that the 12 step programs rely on today, it's ringed in burn marks from the cigarettes that he would put on the sides of the desk all oh, around wow. the desk because he was never able to quit smoking and he died of emphysema. And I remember going in early recovery and seeing that desk and those burn marks, knowing that he died of emphysema and saying, I'm gonna have to break the cigarette habit because it killed him. Wow. But he also, you know, so he smoked throughout his life and he was someone who suffered from depression. He wrote a lot about niacin and how it helped him. He actually did a, um, his own like impromptu kind of a test where he gave people different amounts of niacin. And there was three groups. There was about 30 people who volunteered from AA uh, meetings here in New York. So he kept track to see how the, you know, vitamin B or niacin impacted them. Right. And so he was so, um, he would, he, they saw results that indicated they, that people were benefiting from taking vitamin B, taking niacin. So he wrote a pamphlet that he sent out to various doctors. And that's when the AA board said to him, you don't have a medical degree. Mm. You have no background. Right. You got to register a dietitian. So you can make, you can't be on the AA board, the same board of the organization that he co-founded, but you can't stay on our board if you're going to be doing those things. And so he stepped down from the board. Excuse me, he didn't step down from the board. He stopped doing the research so he could stay on the AA board. Wow. And so that's the history. And I think that that was where, because he had spoken about, and again, all the citations to the authority is in mm -hmm. my book, evidence-based. So every premise in there, every conclusion has a citation. Um, you know, but what he wanted to do was actually to incorporate, um, you know, how we have the traditions and, and different sure. um, in, into the actual traditions and the steps, potentially some changes to lifestyle. Wow. And that, that, that stopped when they gave him the ultimatum because he made the decision it was more important to stay within the organization. But I think that that's kind of the genesis of why we find now many people will say it's an outside issue. But sure. it's not, I mean, I'll just, uh, then I'll shut up, but yeah. this is my passionate about this issue. You know, the research again in the book shows that uh, of people who are admitted to inpatient um, rehabilitation, between 70 to 92% are either type two diabetic or hypoglycemic. That's, that's a huge number. So what they're eating or not eating or is, is relevant to how they're going to be treated in the inpatient setting. And this statistic blows my mind and it makes me so sad every time I hear it. According to the Mayo Clinic in California, not some eccentric uh, place that no one's ever heard of, the Mayo Clinic in California, their nicotine dependence program, 52% of all people they surveyed who identify as being in addiction recovery have died of some smoking related illness, either from continuing to smoke into recovery or as a consequence of, of the prior behavior. So wow. I don't hear people talk about that much, but this is really critical information for people who wanna not just get abstinent, but sober, healthy, and happy. Yeah, no, that's, man, and that's, you know, I love hearing, because we don't wanna just hear you know, someone's opinion, right? I mean, I think it's always good to hear, you know, s something backed with with facts and uh, like you said, just real evidence, um, you know, from a place that has a background of, of looking into and researching these things. So that's, that's all really helpful stuff. And I think it's important to say, you know, that um, 
while so, you know someone might be listening to this and they're thinking like okay like big deal you know c- cigarettes like I, I was doing heroin you know and robbing people or or whatever you know and, and I get that too you know I think um, a lot of people kind of just suggested to me that I handle one thing you know one thing at a time you know and, and kind of take care of the most important stuff first but you make a really interesting point and, and I think it's a good one and it's essentially hey yeah let's let's take care of that you know the most uh, pressing issues or substance substances first but then at the, the end of the day like we want you to stay here and stay sober and and live a a, a healthy a healthy life and really live the best life that you can and I I know that for me, like really where things just kind of didn't again, like just didn't feel aligned was where, uh, when I started going to the gym, man, I would be like chain smoking a few cigarettes before I went into the gym and then chain smoking a few cigarettes when I went out or came out. And eventually I was just like, this, this doesn't really match what, what I'm doing. And um, so, you know, I, I've, I know buddies that, that have quit smoking. I, I've got buddies that have really struggled with it and want to quit. And I know other people that are still smoking and they don't see it as, as a big deal right now. And that's, that's their thing. But I think at the end of the day, I mean, especially with the numbers you just presented, um, that it's something to be uh, aware of, definitely from a, a smoking uh, perspective as well. Well, you know, I, listen, uh, everyone has to make their own choices. What, one of the things that I did in early recovery was I looked at the people I wanted to be more like okay. and, and really kind of aspired to be living the kind of lifestyle they were living. Yeah, and for sure. people smoke. And so everyone has to make their own choices. But here's what I say to that. I also want to mention the Detroit Recovery Project right now. Shout out to the Detroit Recovery Project. It's a great organization. Is doing an online a quit smoking program, which is, I think is the oh, very great. one that's been done in, in the in sobriety that I'm aware of. I interviewed the, one of the founders uh, and the person who's in charge of that program. So if you're looking to quit smoking, go check out the Detroit Recovery Project because uh, they have a free program that's virtual right now. But Jonathan, here's here's you know this and I know this. And let me just say one thing. I have my book right here. That's what it looks like. Uh, it, there's over, every chapter has citations to authority. And the reason I, I went to the trouble of actually reading the research and citing the research is when I was in early recovery, I read a lot of, I read everything I could get on nutrients and food and the interrelationship and exercise, you know, and recovery. Many of them were books that didn't cite to the back, the backup material, the credible scientific information that backed it up and i found that some of them just said hey the alcohol um, the vitamin cure to alcoholism you know right if right. it was that easy nobody would have a problem quitting yeah, right right i want to put together a book that people could rely on as a resource because it's credible because it's evidence-based okay and here's what the research suggests and listen people can they can take what works and they can leave the rest sure. but if you are smoking you are contributing to anxiety there is no research to date that, sh- that uh, lays out the percentage of people in addiction recovery with anxiety. But I am one of those people. I don't know if you are. I never realized until I got sober how much anxiety I get. Mm. And I think if you go to meetings, if you participate in any kind of recovery forums, anxiety is a major problem for people in, in addiction. Okay. Yeah. Smoking makes anxiety worse. Smoking makes depression worse because as your body is 2000 toxins in each cigarette. Okay. Think about that flowing through your blood. Think about that going into the capillaries in your lungs. There is absolutely no way. Look at what's happening with COVID-19. I mean, I see people out here. I live in New York City smoking yeah. cigarettes. I'm like, right. What is it going to take? But that tells me how addictive they are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But all these sub illnesses that permeate addiction recovery, anxiety, depression, all of it, the sedimentary lifestyle mm-hmm. can be worsened by cigarette smoking. There's no way around it. So look, everyone has to do what makes them comfortable. And what's right for them i'm not criticizing anybody because i've been there and yeah. i know how hard it is. Sure. but i'm telling you now if you're able to break that addiction to the nicotine and all the other toxins in those cigarettes 
you're gonna, and not that I'm telling you, the science is gonna tell you. Sure. But you're gonna reduce your anxiety. You're probably gonna be able to, to move more. Your lungs will function better. You can get out and do some more exercise, walk in a park. That's gonna impact your, um, your uh, depression. And one more thing that's really, really important, and I'm gonna talk about this, I hope, later. When you smoke, you're killing the good bacteria that your body needs. Hmm to produce enzymes and other quote unquote feel good hormones. And from most of the major organ systems in the body, and cigarette smoking makes it, they're toxic, it's toxic. Yeah. The liver, if you're in recovery, and you've, like me, let's take me, 24 years of drinking, 18 years of doing cocaine, you know, and then I smoked for 24. So my lungs, my liver needed to heal. It didn't need to continue to get you know, 24 times a day, 48 times a day, toxins sucked in yeah. that it to deal with. So there's, it may seem like it's less, um, less dangerous than heroin, but I will tell you this, my lungs still hurt. Even after seven years of smoking, hmm. I feel tingling in the back of my lungs, even though I eat right and I exercise. And I'm really concerned that I'm probably going to die of some lung related illness. Wow. Because it's, still hurts. When I was got first got sober from doing coke, my my chest, I had chest pain, gone after the first year of working out, eating right and taking care of myself. My lungs still hurt. So I'm really concerned about that. I just want to share that with people out yeah. there. No, I, I think I think that's important. And and I get what you're saying. And I think this is kind of what I was touching on. Like I, I think we can agree like it is the the lesser evil if you want to rank this stuff but but yeah i think it's still something in, important to look at you know just uh you refer to it as as a healthy lifestyle and i think that's a good good way to uh you, you know to kind of present it and and look at it so you know okay, there, one thing, Jonathan, that's really funny is ozzy osborne was interviewed and he's like ah oh, and in one of the interviews he gave he said no i, I did heroin but i would never stop smoking that <laughs> shit will kill you <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> I, so, like, I listened to Ozzy Osbourne. That's <laughs> pretty good. He it, so, so yeah. I, I was just going to say, you know, there, there are probably some people that are listening that, um, you know, maybe struggled or feel like it's too hard to start making some, some healthy changes in their life. Because look, I, I think that, you know, uh, being someone that coaches people in recovery, you know, obviously talks to a lot of people in recovery, wh whether or not um, someone is actually making what most of us would would see as healthier decisions, ah. I mm -hmm. would say that most people probably want to to some degree, you know, and and they might be struggling with that or seem, you know, uh, maybe think it's too hard, I guess, but that's not really the case, right? So, what are some examples of things that people can start doing to just move in the right direction towards this this healthy lifestyle and sobriety? Would you say? Well, I mean. <laughs> I have a whole chapter that's there's a detox chapter and then there's a 30 day plan. That's the okay. beginning plan. it's the little things. Uh, there's a movie with Bill Murray where he goes baby steps, baby steps. Uh, he's being, he's in therapy and his, his therapist is telling him, you're not going to change everything overnight. It's mm. the baby steps. You know, I think for someone who's just getting started having breakfast in the morning. Okay. Breaking the habit. If it's a cigarette smoker, like the first thing I did was I was religiously on my toilet bowl smoking my my cigarette before anything else, you know. And then so I was trying to quit because it's hard. And sure. I started with little things, little. I used to put my cigarettes downstairs in the mailbox, so I didn't have them in my apartment, so I couldn't get a cigarette in the morning. I couldn't wow. smoke until I actually left, you know. Yeah. Um. So that's another one. I mean, you know, go to, when you go to Starbucks, they have well, not anymore because you can't go inside, but. It, it, we'll get back to that. Or if you're going to a gas station, they'll have different sugar options. They'll have honey. They'll have right. refined, good old fashioned Domino's refined sugar. They'll have stevia. Stay away from the refined sugar. Just that's huge, huge for your blood sugar, huge for your anxiety, huge. If you can just, instead of when you're getting your, your latte in, uh, in the morning, you know, put some natural honey in, or if you're at home, instead of using the, the refined sugars as sweeteners, 
have, you know, j just have some honey. It's going to make a huge difference. Um, there's so many different types of sweeteners. Again, I have a whole list in the book, yeah. but also trying to structure eating. I mean, I don't know anybody who came into active addiction with a healthy eating uh, regimen or relationship with food. No way. Yeah, not we me. We have that. Yeah. We have to learn how to nourish the body with something other than alcohol, or cocaine, heroin, or crystal meth, or whatever, and cigarettes, right? Yeah. Um, that was hard for me because I would go days at a time. You know, I was so addicted, and I want to say this: that people don't think like that. You know, I wasn't there, and I can't relate. I was so addicted that when I would finish my Coke or whatever, and I had no money, I had, I had a choice. I could buy food or I would go around the apartment and pick up all the pennies, the dimes and the quarters and put them in a big jar. Be, okay, so I have 12 bucks. Should I get food? And 12 bucks was what a cigarette pack cost in New York City at that time. Jeez. I would go get the cigarette pack and I'd stand there with $12 and change as a cashier and people would be fuming behind me. You know what I'm trying to say? So that, and then I went in for days, I would just smoke and do drugs. So like, it's important because if you just think about the structure of not only what you're eating, but when you're eating, like I know now I get, I'm a, I'm middle-aged, I'm 52 years old. I get grumpy, you know, and like, if I don't eat, <laughs> it gets really worse. It yeah. really impacts my, my mood. There's something being called being hangry angry and hungry at the same time as hangry i've been there so, you know you've been there so it's like i think just kind of saying okay i gotta make sure i have breakfast because that's people tell me that's important and i'm gonna make sure i eat something in the middle of the morning and then i'm gonna structure my lunch right i'm just gonna write down maybe what i'm eating or make sure i have something those little changes over time add up exponentially and i also want to say one thing because i think this is critical for people in recovery. Um, I used to go to a seven o'clock meeting every day for a year, and then sometimes I would go to an eight o'clock meeting. And the coffee would be out, and people would be drinking the coffee, and they had cookies, and they had sugar, and half and half, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I remember people, and myself included. So I was taking a sleeping pill at that time. <laughs> I would tell my doctor, I can't sleep at night. But I never really linked the fact that I was drinking coffee at a seven o'clock meeting and eating cookies and sugar with the fact that I couldn't go to bed. I would be up until like two or three in the morning, then kind of nod off and then, you know, try to get up early and be miserable. So like, think about what you're putting in your body at what time of the day. Yeah. And how it's going to impact you because food and drinks, they're, they're just like drugs and alcohol in the sense they have chemical components. And your body reacts to it. And so just by cutting out drinking, like I have a caffeine cutoff and I write about that in the book. I have a sugar cutoff and I have a, a, my cell phone gets turned off and all electronic devices now at 8 p.m. It used to be 9 p.m. Done. And my brain slows down so I can sleep. You know, one of the things I think anybody out there, just give it a try. And it's so hard. I started doing this like years ago and I remember turning my phone off. I was like, no, I can't do that. Like I felt like so alone. It was wow. a scary thing to shut yeah. my phone. Now I can't, I can't imagine not shutting my phone off at eight, at 8 PM. And back in the early days of recovery, when I would turn my phone back on and I had changed my cell phone, which is what they tell us to do. Yep, I yep. was getting text messages from my partying friends here in New York City, like, hey, we're gonna be at this bar and we're gonna grab some eight balls. Man, you're out of rehab now, you can come in. I was like, that, all that drama didn't happen hmm. because I was shutting the phone off at night. Yeah, no, that's a, that's so, a really good habit to get into. And, and it's, honestly, it's I've really got to be- hard. It's really hard, it John. You know. I've got to be better about that, limiting the screen time at, at night. You know, one of the things that you just mentioned that I think is so important, and um, I, I'm a big proponent of, it's one of the main things that I guess I, I you know, you could say it this way, I try to kind of instill in, in people that I work with. And I think it's just so important for, for anyone, but especially people in- uh, addiction or in recovery is that the idea of baby steps and and for someone like I said that you know is maybe uh, struggling with with you know getting some healthy habits going or getting active or eating a little better 
I think it's important to think of the baby steps um, from, from two perspectives. It's number one, hey, something is better than nothing. Mm -hmm. Something is better than nothing. You know, so getting out and going for a walk is better than just being completely sedentary, right? And then the other reason that I think baby steps are, are so important is because I think, and this is, again, just people in general, but definitely people like me with addictive personalities is, you know, like when I first started getting active, I really liked it. But at the same time, what I saw is like with my nutrition, for instance, okay, I had been eating total crap, uh, you know, for, for years, Mm -hmm. And, and like, like you said, I had no routine or anything like that, but I had been eating total crap and the way my mind thought is, okay, starting tomorrow, I'm going to be eating chicken breasts. I'm going to be eating broccoli stuff, you know, basically like stuff that, because it has to be a, a awful thing, right? Like eating healthy, which is not true, but I didn't take this baby step approach. I tried to change everything drastically. So not active at all, super active, not eating great, you know, eating perfect, basically. And the thing is, is that it, that's not sustainable for most people, right? I know you're 100 you're hundred percent right. But we, I think that we are all, especially when you have an addictive personality, we are our own worst enemies. And that's why... People like you, you train people and you know, you have clients that you work with. I don't, I'm a lawyer full time at this point, but um, I created the online spiritual adrenaline community. Yeah. Because everybody that's part of it is over 80,000 people and our specific thrust and like sober nations are wonderful. It's huge and it, there's so much great information, but we focus specifically on exercise and nutrition. Yeah, right? that's and, awesome, yeah overactive specific um, community and that's what makes I think that, that and it's all free we have like two, over 200 free videos on the YouTube channel we don't charge for anything on the blog as well and the reason I bring that up is this if someone's out there right now watching this, this interview and they live in Pueblo Colorado I can introduce them to Rob and Sheena Archuleta if they're in one of 20 states in the country in some other parts of the world now and they're looking to get involved, they can find information on Scott Strode and the Phoenix, yeah. right? Yeah. And to be one of his great yoga teachers in New Jersey, you know, and temperance training down in Florida, uh, is doing great work. So uh, Caleb and, and Caitlin McCoy on the Eastern Band of Cherokee Nation uh, are doing organizing to help people in the Native American community really get at the cycle of addiction there. Is yeah. Wilson is, and they're all over the country. Alexi Talbot up in Canada. Uh, Graham McCormick, he's a former mixed martial artist champion, and he's based out of Cork, Ireland, and he now has his own page. So I can I get contacted all the time by people, not only from the United States, but all over the world, saying, Do you know anybody here? And I do. I know people in the United Kingdom. That was the whole idea behind spiritual adrenaline. So if okay. someone's out there, and looking to meet people or an organization that can help them pace themselves, mm -hmm. not self, um, not self-destruct, not self-sabotage. And also, one of the things I talk about in the book is it's important to have, I use the term from the 12-step world, a sponsor who can show you the way. Sure. Because quite frankly, this is a sponsor who has succeeded at integration beyond just abstinence from the substance but integration into the lifestyle change, mm. right? Yeah. And so I'm telling you, that what's great about these people, I wanna to mention too, because it's the only organization in New York that do such great work, is Rock Recovery Fitness up in, in Rochester, New York. They can go, anybody watching this can go to our website right now, or they can go to our Facebook page right now. They can look up the contacts for those organizations. They can watch my interviews with the people. And the, I, I don't even, I interview the founders, Okay. The things they always do is they're like, you got to interview this guy. You got to interview her. And I, I, I interview their members oh, wow. who completely turn their lives around. Yeah. And anybody who says, I can't do it, go to our YouTube channel and watch some of my interviews with regular people. But I want to mention one because I just did an interview with him for Spiritual Adrenaline. Scott Richardson was almost, uh, he was 450 pounds wow. thereabouts. Wow. Yeah, it goes back years and years and years. He could barely walk. 
He was an active alcoholic in addition to being huge. He was, and he wound up getting sober. He then was diagnosed by cancer. It's a long, you gotta watch this interview. And so he overcame cancer. He, he stayed sober through that. He now helps tra uh, train Team USA triathletes. I mean, it's wow. amazing stuff. And he just That's got awesome. certified by NASM. And when you, I had his before and after photo, like when you hear that other people have done it and they start with those little baby steps, it reinforces that they can do it. And then one other thing about the book that I think would be helpful for people who are maybe self-doubters. Again, evidence-based. I looked at almost all the major research that's been done on exercise benefits for people in addiction recovery yeah. and all the chapter on recovery and exercise. And what the research shows, I actually break out the amount of time by activity okay. and what amount of time and how many days a week shows the most benefits for people in recovery oh, wow. based on the scientific research. So if you like, um, if you like uh, kickboxing, you can do that, basketball, running, swimming, you know, everyone has different interests, but they can start to see what the recommendations are. But the really underlying import of all of those studies, and this goes to something that you raised, this is so important for someone just getting started, even five minutes a day of walking outside in the fresh air, preferably in a park where there's green trees and a lawn, has major impact for people in dealing with anxiety, hmm. depression, which are two of the major um, common illnesses or conditions that are found in people in recovery. And wow. so the research is clear. You don't have to run a marathon. You know, every I, I, I was like, when I tell me, tell me if you did this because we have a lot in common. I was like, I'm going to become a triathlete, and then I'm going to do the Ironman. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. I never did either of those things yeah. because someone put rein me in and said, "Chill, out. Yeah. Man. Oh Stop. yeah. No, a absolutely. I mean, I I think that you know, for, for me, um, and, and I think a lot of people do this, like you're talking about walking, like today, I, I love walking. Like, I mean, I think, and I think that a lot of people, maybe someone trying to get in shape, especially is like walking, like, you know, what's that going to do? Like people don't understand, like bodybuilders walk a lot, you know, like there's so many benefit, mental and physical benefits to, to something. But yeah, like I got into, um, you know, jogging initially. And like, I kind of found out, like, I'm not a big, jogger like I could go for a jog occasionally but it's just not really you know yeah. not really my my thing you know and I think you're you're leading up to this and, and you've kind of touched on it uh, kind of grazed it so to speak um, I know and and you've just said it as well but I know how much um, you know fitness and nutrition have have benefited my recovery and continue mm -hmm. to do you think, and, and does the research point to at all, because I think this is what most people really care about, like they might not care about being healthy, but they probably, you know, or the idea of being healthy, but they probably care about this. Do you think that, that paying attention to your, your fitness and your nutrition has an impact on whether or not someone relapses? I mean, uh, my opinion is different from what the research sure. is. Yeah, but, sure. Let, let me just take it first by, again, in, in the chapter where I deal with the 12-step community, mm -hmm. I looked at AA's own statistics. These are not made up by me. It's okay. not well, uh, some critic of uh, AA, but I asked for their internal statistics, and I was able to obtain them okay. on the uh, success rates over periods of time. Okay, so after a five-year period, um, the 10% of, of the people who were surveyed had remained in. That's what their statistics show. Yeah. After 10 years, 1% success rate. That's AA's own statistics. And they're wow. in. So, that being said, um, we look at uh, the, there's only one organization. Well, let me, let me take a step back. So we have AA statistics, which are not in dispute. Anyone can get them out of my book or they can email me or email AA if they'll give them to me. The secondary issue becomes, can we prove that relapse rates are lower for people who um, integrate exercise and nutrition? So I 
uh, I'm contacted all the time by graduate students asking to see my research because I spend so much time researching the book. Okay. There's only two programs that have statistics relating to this topic. And that's uh, Scott Strode at the Phoenix, and that's Rob and Sheena Archuleta at Addict to Athlete. Okay. Uh, Scott he kept a, um, a random assessment. Um, it's, it's not scientifically based, and he doesn't he doesn't uh, you know claim it to be. But they did a survey of people who had come into the program over a specific period of time. Mm -hmm. Their relapse rates, based upon that that particular time where they surveyed what they called their users. Are much lower than the statistics I cited earlier for AA. But here's the real kicker, and this what this is what gets Scott so excited when we speak about it, is that the re, the return to the Phoenix program, which it's a it's a workout program, it's a CrossFit program, it's an active, it's not institutional for those people who don't know what the Phoenix is, right? Right, right. But the, the rate of people coming back into the program after relapse is very high. Hmm. And when I asked Scott, I interviewed him for my book, why he thought that was so, it's because it's such a nurturing, non-judgmental community that revolves around CrossFit, it revolves around surfing, it revolves around hiking, it revolves around these kinds of activities. Like, it's not a meeting where you have to go sit in a room with people like, I, you know, one day back, that kind of a thing. Right, it's just right. possibly better than the other. What I'm suggesting to you is it's more of a community where people feel comfortable kind of coming back. That's what his statistics show. The only organization in the world right now that actually had, uh, they received a grant to have an outside auditor come in over, I think it was a two year period and track the success rates of participants is addict to athlete in Pueblo, Colorado. Okay. The reason they, they were able to get the grant is they have um, contracts with local court systems uh, where people are sent when they're on probation and other programs. Uh, Rob will kill me if, and she know if I misspeak. So there's a number of different programs they have with the court system. So the courts wanted to analyze whether or not people who are in the criminal justice system because of some lifestyle where they were, they admitted they had problems with drugs. Right. What were the ratios of success with recidivism, which means, you know, committing another crime, yeah, following right. parole, right? So they measured all these things. And I just did a presentation with Sheena Archuleta, where we actually, and I have the presentation, if there's anybody out there in the treatment community would like to see the numbers. In addition to looking at recidivism rates, and long-term recovery rates. They also looked at the ability of the participants when they first came in to the program. We talked about baby steps. Yeah. These are not people who could jog around the block. These are people who most of whom in their entire life had not worked out, could have a difficulty with one sit-up, one push-up. Sure. But they actually measured that criteria as well as the larger picture. Wow. Their relapse rates were substantially lower for people who participated in the addict to athlete program than they were for those in that same population who didn't get uh, participate into in the program. Wow. Not only was their relapse rate lower, right, but their fitness rate, what they were able to do from the day they walked to the door. I get I'm emotional now talking about because this is beautiful. This is someone's life, right? So what they could do when they walked in the door to when they finished the program was exponentially different. And I don't want to misspeak because I think the facts are important. Sure, but sure. people went from like one sit up to 40 sit ups. Right. Like that's a big difference, but they felt better in their lifestyle. Yeah. So um, you know, again, Addict to Athlete has all those statistics. It's the only program in the world that I'm aware of uh, that actually has proven that when you integrate lifestyle modification to overall addiction recovery, you get a better result. And one more thing that I want to speak to on the Addict to Athlete program, they have a weekly curriculum that's been developed by the Archuletas, and now they have coaches who started out as participants in that program, okay. who teach it, and they talk about uh, the different lifestyle components that we're talking about. Yeah. Like, Food. <laughs> What's, you know, why is it important? You know, sleep, like and, and basic relearning basic life skills. 
And so I think that's really of critical import. And I, again, I'm, the, I'm an advocate for the sober active community. I'm an advocate for addict to athlete. I'm an advocate for the Phoenix rock recovery, fitness, temperance training, uh, Caleb, you know, um, down in North Carolina, uh, Alexi Graham. I mean, I talk about these great people, the Detroit recovery project. There's a new one in, in Phoenix of just the barbell saves great new program that just got started up in Phoenix. So I'm an advocate for these programs because it worked for me. It's worked for thousands and thousands of other people. It's worked for all the founders and the members, not, not everybody, but many of them had failed staying sober before they did this for themselves. And we have 80,000 members of our Facebook community, okay? Wow. And I think the reason we do is because this is the missing link I, mean, I, I say to myself all the time, and I know you do, Jonathan, I know you do. Like, why, why is this not taught? Why do we not just give, give people an inpatient just that little taste, you know, sure. of why it works and, and more facilities and do that. I actually got exposed to it. I got the award for most improved swimmer at Conifer Park in, in New York. Um, I'm still friends with the uh, recreation therapist, Abby, who is there. Uh, we, we do, we've actually, I've gone up to speak a bunch of times and she pushed me to not just sit at the table and sulk, but get in the pool and swim again. And so I started with like one lap or two laps and I was doing like 40 to 50. I can't remember by the time I was discharged. So it wow. works. You know, I just, anyone out there, just give it a, listen, if, it, if you don't like it, if it doesn't work for you, you can stop. You have nothing to lose sure. and maybe like a whole life to gain no. by giving it a try. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Yeah, and I think, and you said it, look, like everyone's different. And I, I think, and I appreciate you being honest. Like I, I think that uh, one thing we're kind of discovering here and, and you discovered long ago is that more research and, and study needs to be done here. Um, you know, and, but it sounds like there's definitely some promising evidence that's that's come out about you know how all of this affects you know someone's ability to uh stay sober and stay in recovery in the long term but i think you know the simple question that that i ask myself and i think that people should consider is hey don't i want to do everything possible to to help benefit my recovery and and I think that what I really started to see on top of that is, is that not only did this benefit my, my recovery um, and my ability to stay sober, it really helped me because, you know, I was noticing things like, um, man, like, you know, I like to lift. And, and so between sets, I was almost meditating a little bit and, and I was having little wins in the gym, which was boosting my confidence. And that helped me in my career. And if your career is good, then you're probably not going to be stressed out and, and want to go get higher drinks. So all these things, and, and you pointed this out earlier, everything works together. It, it all works together. And I'm with you, man. I mean, I really do think that this is one of the missing, uh, one of the missing links. And I appreciate you just touching on, you know, the history and, and 12 step programs about all of this and, and how many people around the country uh, including yourself, are involved in in really this uh, active sober movement because it's it's just so so incredible. So before we wrap up, Tom, I, I want to ask you what is one piece of advice that you would like to share with the sober nation? I, I just think um, the the biggest mistake is to not believe in your capacity to change and to have your body heal. One of the focuses in the book is that the body will heal if you give it, and the mind as well, the nutrients it needs to succeed and to undo the damage from years of active addiction. I follow a 12-step path. That's a great medicine for the mind, but it's not a medicine for the body, right? So if you, knew, if you use the 12 steps or whatever, whatever recovery program works for you, psychologically go for it but try integrating something for the body to accompany it and i think you're going to see that your success and your happiness is exponentially more because you're taking care of the physical body that holds your brain 
and enables you to think differently and to think more positively. And it all starts with those little baby steps that we talked about earlier. Wow. That's man. That's awesome advice. And yeah, I think that you and I are, are certainly on the same page. I'm with you a hundred percent and and we could say it a bunch of different ways, but you know, body, mind, spirit, I'm, I'm someone that's a big believer that it all works together and, um, you know, doing something to pay attention to our, our physical body as part of our sobriety and, and recovery, I think is super important. So that's great advice. Uh, you can learn more about Tom and Spiritual Adrenaline by visiting spiritualadrenaline.com. And of course, their Facebook page where you can find out more about their uh, online community. Thanks again for coming on today, Tom. Thank you so much. Uh, it was really great to see you again, Jonathan. I wish everybody out there in Server Nation all the best and all the success in their life and their recovery. Be sure to check out the show notes for all the info from today's episode. Sober Nation FM is brought to you by Sobriety Engine. Sobriety Engine is a free online community of men and women supporting each other in their recovery. Visit sobrietyengine.com to join today. This show is also brought to you by Recover Health. If you're ready to get fit and start living a healthier lifestyle while supporting your sobriety, you can learn more about having me as your own personal fitness and nutrition coach at rcvrhealth.com. And again, whether you're listening to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or watching on YouTube, please share this with your friends, follow, subscribe, and leave us a review. Nation, thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.